So we'll be taking a look at the uh, data paths and the pipelining in architectures like MIPS in this series of videos. All right, so the, the notes that you see here are taken from uh, a course that was taught by Dr. Mary Jane Irwin, uh, the CS431 class at PSU. The original link for her website is here. Uh, I've added web archive links using bit.ly and tinyurl there as well. You can also find references to this kind of material in the Patterson and Hennessy textbook in uh, that was published for the MIPS architecture as well, specifically chapter four. All right. So the, uh, the, the MIPS architecture is also what we typically find in things like the PIC32MX and that that we've used in class. And um, there are certain design principles that uh, that have been sort of baked into um, the MIPS processors. Basically, simplicity uh, favors regular regularity. Um, there are fixed size instructions, there are a small number of instruction formats, and the opcodes um, uh, basically are encoded into the first six bits of, of the instruction. Um, smaller is faster is another design principle. So uh, that means that in terms of the implementation, there's a limited instruction set, there are limited numbers of registers in the register file. Uh, that's just basically all the registers that you have access to. Um, there are a limited number of addressing modes as well. Um, it's, it's also been um, sort of baked in that the, the, uh, the, the common case is fast. And so basically what we want to know is that uh, the arithmetic operands uh, come from the registers. That is, we're dealing with uh, load store uh, machines when we talk about MIPS. And, and that basically means that we're bringing uh, data in from uh, data memory, putting into registers, and then the arithmetic operations occur on the registers, not directly on data memory. Um, and uh, also, uh, instructions are allowed to c contain immediate operands. So you can have sort of hard-coded fixed values in there as well that don't come from data memory. Um, also, it's important that to, to note that good design basically de demands good compromises. And so... Um, uh, there's sort of a, a combination between uh, flexibility and, and, and limitation in terms of um, uh, uh, variability. And so there's only three instruction formats in the MIPS architecture. All right. Now, in terms of the data path, so we're going to be talking about data path and, and pipelining in this series of, of videos. The, uh, the, the, the direction that was taken or the strategy that was taken by Dr. Irwin uh, was to, to look at a simplified version of MIPS. In our case, we took a look at the PIC32 architecture, the full out thing. Um, but in terms of if you needed to, to sort of minimize it into the uh, bare essentials of what are really important to understand sort of the flow of things inside of uh, a MIPS processor, there are three basic categories of instructions that are important to know when you look at it from the assembler perspective. One is uh, memory reference instructions. So load word and store word. So when we're transferring stuff from uh, data memory into the registers and vice versa, then you have arithmetic and logical instructions. And the basic ones are, you know, sort of add, sub, and, or, and SLT. And then you've got uh, control flow instructions. So you've got uh, one of the branches and one of the jump instructions as well. With that, you can get most of the basic concepts in, uh, in sort of a, a nice 32-bit processor like a MIPS or PIC32. The, uh, the implementation that, that she took um, also is, is minimized, but it, it's really the, the core of what's going on even on a, on a full-out MIPS processor is basically what you've got are, are sort of three um, states that are going on. Uh, you've got your, um, your fetch state or the action that's taken, and there that involves the program counter. And so what you end up doing is you go fetching an instruction from memory, and then once that's done, then you decode that series of, of numbers basically into you know what is it supposed to do, and and those numbers get get placed on wires that basically get transferred into the rest of the circuitry of the CPU that allow certain things to execute. So once it's been decoded, then you can execute the instruction that had had been brought in from memory, decoded, and then well then, then the adding or the subtracting or the ending or whatever that is happens at that point. And then we once that's done, then you go back and you fetch another instruction. So 
you use the program counters to supply the instruction address and fetch the instruction from memory, and then you decode the instruction, basically you know, read registers uh, also, and, and then you, exe you execute the instruction. Those are the three things that are going on. So one, two, three. All the instructions, except for jump, use the in, in this sort of minimized uh, set, use the ALU um, after reading the registers. All right, next up. In terms of sort of instruction execution, it's important to, to point out that the program counter is being used, the registers are being used, and uh, depending on, on which instruction is being um, sort of executed, the ALU or the arithmetic logic unit will be will kick in to calculate an arithmetic result or a memory address for load and store or to calculate the uh, address to branch to to jump to okay um, as well there could be uh, accessing data memory for load and store and updating of the program counter basically taking uh, figuring out what the target address is or taking the current program counter and adding four to it because we're talking about 32-bit uh, instructions and so you're always uh, incre incrementing in four so four times eight bits 32 okay next up so you'll when you're looking at um, diagrams of CPUs you'll often see these sort of layouts of, of, um, of parts you've got your program counter you've got your instruction memory you've got re your registers you've got your ALU your arithmetic logic unit you got your data memory and then you've got uh, some update circuitry right here that allow the the program counter to to update itself now if you're programming one of these processors say in MPLAB X you've got access to your program counter up here you've got your data memory right your data memory your program counter so your program counter your data memory your registers okay they're right here as well um, so there's your registers you, you don't see the ALU in here but you know those correspond to instructions um, or sorry operations um, or the, it's not the operation the, not the code itself but what it, they get engaged by the code that you write and um, and so when you when you sort of step through using your debugger and you've landed on a particular instruction you're at a particular program counter there then depending on what that instruction is stuff will be fetched from data memory or the ALU will be uh, engaged etc and then once that's all done, then this kicks in right here to update the program counter as you step to the next line in your in your code. That's basically what's going on in here. Okay. Now, in in terms of of what's going on from a hardware perspective, you've got these lines that show sort of flow of of things that are going from instruction memory to the registers to the ALU, etc. But but the way these things sort of combine isn't as straightforward as it's made out to look here. We have to use multiplexers um, to join wires together. And, and this is basically what it looks like. So you've got your program counter over here, you've got your instruction memory over here, you've got your registers over here, you've got your ALU right here. But look, there's a multiplexer, a MUX, in between the ALU and the registers. And that is being controlled by some other circuitry that allows the coordination of these different um, signals that, that travel from from here to there to there and then back again all right so you got these multiplexers at different locations you've got combinational logic as well that allow all of these things to be glued together and to allow flow of data from one element to another in the time it takes for the clock to go up and down up and down up and down or tick tock tick tock tick tock now when we talk about how all of these blocks are connected together, we really have to know a little bit about how, uh, well, logic design works. And uh, and so it's important to know that everything is encoded in binary, that a low voltage is a, a binary value of zero, and a high voltage, which could be 1.7 volts, it could be 3.3 volts, it could be 5 volts, depending on what sort of standard you've got. But basically, a high voltage has a binary value of 1. There is one wire per bit. And if you have more than one bit, so you have an 8-bit CPU or you've got a 32-bit uh, CPU, multiple data or multiple bit data are encoded on multi-wire 
buses, or you could think of them as cables. Okay, so you've got multi-wire cables that are going from one component to the next component. You have combinational uh, elements that operate on the data, um, and the output of these combinational elements are functions of the inputs. We're talking about things like AND gates and things like that. Then you have state or sequential elements that store information. Where do we normally store information? Things like registers. Okay. Now, we talked about combinational elements. They could be AND gates, like that. So these are the inputs. That's the output. That's the output. These are the inputs. You have your adders, so your output and your inputs. You have your output and your inputs. Okay, so A and B added together gives you Y. You have your multiplexers, which allow uh, the changing of one input to be the output versus another input to be the output. Okay, basically it's a switch that allows switching from either there or from there to go to the output. Then you have arithmetic logic units that combine all these elements together to do things like adding um, and, and, and that sort of thing. All right. Now, in terms of sequential elements, what we're talking about are things like those registers. Okay, so when you're programming and you put data into a register, then you do some addition on it. Well, the, the, it's actually a piece of hardware that's sitting inside of the, the computer. Okay, and here's basically what we're talking about. You've got this memory element that has an input D and an output Q, and, and it stores inside of it a bit. It could be a one, it could be a zero, and it's designed to change when the clock changes. All right, so the, the clock goes tick, tock, tick, tock, tick. And in this case, what, uh, what, it's, what this particular circuit is designed to do is to make changes every time there's a tick, 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 tick. So what happens is that when a tick occurs, so you get a tick in here into the clock, it takes a look, this block right here, takes a look at the uh, logic value, either a zero or a one on the input and um, say it was a zero. Okay. It says, oh, that's a zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to update my, um, my value of Q, which maybe originally was a one, and it transitions after the tick, okay? A certain amount of time afterwards, there's a little bit of a delay. And that says, oh, now we're gonna be a zero. Then on the next tick, we take a look at the value of, of D, okay? And if the, the value of D was still zero, then we say, oh, no, that's gonna stay zero until the next tick right here, and then it takes a look at, uh, let's say in between those clock cycles, it changed and became a one, okay? Then the next time there's a tick right here, I'll say, ah, what's my value on my input? It's a one, so now I'm gonna transition and I'm gonna become a one, okay? That's basically what's going on right here. Now, we can, typically it's important to have registers with right control. So it's not just on the clock edges that things are happening, but it's a combination of the clock edge and as well, whether or not we want stuff to be written to the to the memory element. So you've got your tick, talk, tick, talk, tick, like that. And we're only going to transition on the ticks. And then what we say is uh, yes to, to writing or no to writing yes to writing or no so when it's high it's yes when it's no, when it's low so it's either high and this is time right here okay so time is transitioning like this or it's no if it's no we don't write when it's high we do write so there's a tick right here write is also uh, positive so then whatever the value of say d was like that and let's say the output originally was zero then we get a transition here because there was both at this stage right here, a, a one and a transition. Okay, that edge right here. So basically we know that there should be a change in the output, but the next time there's a tick, that's the transition. So that's when the tick happens, 
we check what the value of right is, it's no, so there's not going to be a change. So Q remains what it was before. Until the next tick, we have an edge right there. We take a look at the state of the right line. It's high. And so we take a look at the value of D and let's imagine it was now zero. Then we can transition down, okay? And so it's important to point out that when we have sort of these symbols in, in sort of timing diagrams, what we mean is that it could either be one or it could be zero. Here it could be one or it could be zero. Here it could be one or it could be zero. And, and the, these are the transition points where it could go from one to zero or zero to one, depending on, on what sort of the history was. That's what we, that's why we have these sort of diagrams right here. All right, finally, uh, clocking methodology. Um, when, when we talk about it, it it's actually it's a design choice and uh, combinational logic transforms data during clock cycles. Basically the ands, the ad additions, the summations, the subtractions, etc., happen between clock edges, between ticks, okay? So I say tick, that's the beginning of uh, one clock cycle. And then between that time and the next tick that occurs, uh, you're supposed to finish all of the work that's supposed to happen in terms of getting the electrical signals through all the different AND gates and multiplexers, etc. During that time, input comes from state elements like our registers. And, and we output to state elements like registers. The longest delay that happens in that, um, uh, in, in that particular sub-circuit or whatever um, determines what our clock period is going to be because you can't have a clock period that's so short that it, it cuts off updates to the sub-circuitry in your processor. So you have to know how long it takes for information to propagate through your AND gates and your multiplexers, etc. It's not instantaneous. So basically, if I have a, in this case, let's say it's a, the tick is the rising edge of my clock, then we access, at that point, we start accessing our state elements, our registers, then we combine things together with AND gates and multiplexers, etc. This takes a little bit of time. And then before we get to the next tick, right here, we need to finish by writing to our state element as well. Okay, so basically what we're doing is we're we're, we're uh, accessing these state elements and these combinational logic uh, elements as well at the same time, or in in that sort of clock period. The clocking methodology defines when data in a state element is valid and stable relative to the clock. So um, our state elements are memory elements such as the registers and we typically want to edge trigger. So that is, we want to start the whole process on either a rising edge of the clock or a falling edge of the clock. You decide which one, okay? Uh, or at least the architecture decides which one. Uh, the typical execution is you read the content to the state elements, you send the values through the combination logic, and then you write results to one or more state elements. Okay, that's basically what's going on here, all right? This assumes that state elements are written on every clock cycle, and if that's not the case, and, and that does occur, then you need to have explicit write control, whether it's going to be, yes, I'm allowing you to write on the clock signal or not. And that's it for the first part.